Hi kids, these notes are going to be over 7.1 Triangle Application Theorems and 7.2 Proof Oriented Triangle Theorems. In 7.1, our essential question is how can I apply theorems about the interior and exterior angles and midlines of triangles to find missing measures? Be sure as you're taking notes to write any questions at all you have in the left column or any questions you think would be good study questions. Also indicate any points of confusion so you can ask your teacher the very next day. The first thing you need to know for this chapter, chapter 7, is something you probably already know and that's if you add up all the angle measures in a triangle, the interior angles, they will add up to 180 degrees. The sum of the measures of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So you, if you have expressions for each of those angles, you can always create an equation. You will say the measure of one angle plus the measure of another angle plus the measure of the third angle equals 180 degrees. And you can always use this to solve for the value of a variable. This next theorem is similar to one we have already spoken of, with, which has to do with the exterior angle of a triangle. An exterior angle of a triangle is made by extending one of its sides at one of its vertices. So for example, if I want to show the exterior angle at point C of this triangle, I have two choices. I could extend BC out this way, or I could extend AC out this way. You are just going to do one of those. So the exterior angle we are talking about right now is this angle right here. We can go ahead and call that angle 1 if we want. Here's what the theorem says. It says the measure of an exterior angle of a triangle is equal to the sum of its two remote interior angles. We've already talked about what the two remote interior angles are. There are three interior angles. The two that are remote are angles A and B because they are the furthest away from C. The angle right next to C, that would be an adjacent interior angle. So we are not talking about that angle. So here's what it says. The measure of angle one is equal to the sum, that means we're adding, the measures of the two remote interior angles. I meant to say the measures. So we're basically taking this and this and we're adding them together. The measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B. And you can replace these three measures with expressions. The last theorem for section 7.1 says a segment joining the midpoints of two sides of a triangle is parallel to the third side and its length is one half the length of the third side. So there are two parts to this. Let's look at the first part. A segment joining the midpoints of two sides of a triangle. Let's go ahead and stop there. Let's pick two sides of this triangle. AB, its midpoint, let's call it uh, D. I'm going to show that it's the midpoint by showing that its two sides are congruent. And I'm going to also show the midpoint of segment BC and let's call it E. So the first part of our theorem is that we have a segment that joins these midpoints. DE is our segment. It says that it is parallel to the third side. The third side would be AC, so we're going to show that with our arrows. And because it's parallel, there may be some same side interior angles, alternate interior angles, corresponding angles, those things from last chapter that we encountered. So you might need to keep that in the back of your head. The second part is that its length is half the length of the third side. So the third side is AC. We're going to say that DE's length equals half of AC's length. Or we could also think of it as DE equals AC divided by 2. 
So if you have expressions that represent the lengths of those two sides, I'm sorry, that one side and the side or the segment that connects the midpoints, there is a relationship there. That segment DE that connects the midpoints of the side of the two sides, this is called the midline. So if we talk about the midline, just find two midpoints of two sides and connect them. There's your midline. Okay, let's try an example. We have this picture as labeled. We need to find the measure of angle E. If you look at your picture, there are two variables. So in order for us to find this measure, we need to find the values of the two variables, which means we need to set up a system, two equations, two variables. If we look at the larger triangle, we see the three angles. We know that the three angles add up to 180. That's one of the theorems from this section. So if we add up the 80 plus angle A, which is made up of two X's, plus angle C, which is made up of two Y's, that should equal 180. There's one equation. If we look at the triangle within that triangle, look at its three angles. We have an angle measure of X, we've got a Y, and then we have some measure for angle E, and that equals 180 degrees. So this is what we're going to start with, and then we'll kind of go from there. Let's look back at our first equation. Let's see if we can't clean it up at all. I can move the 80 over to the left, which means we'll get, I'm sorry, to the right, so we'll get 2x plus 2y. If I subtract 80 from both sides, we'll have 100 on the right. I also can look at my three terms that I've got left, 2x, 2y, and 100. They're all divisible by 2, so if I divide all of them by 2, we can make our equation a little simpler. We'll get x plus y equals 50. Okay, now let's look at our other equation. The other part of our equation, or the other equation that, um, sorry, there's a part of our other equation that is ambiguous that we're trying to find, and that's the measure of angle E. But if you look at what we got, we can actually figure this out. I'm going to switch colors so you can see what we're going to do next. Okay. In our first equation, we said that x plus y equals 50. If x plus y equals 50, then I can take out this x plus y in this other equation, and I can replace it with 50. So now we have 50 plus whatever the measure of angle E is equals 180. I can easily find the measure of angle E now by subtracting 50 from both sides. And we get that the measure of angle E equals 130 degrees. Now what's interesting about this problem is that we didn't solve for X or Y they kind of, we kind of just got rid of them. So we kind of did a version of the elimination method. Or, depending on how you look at it, it could be, it could look like the substitution method. But this was really interesting in that we did not have to find the values of x and y. It's not important. Here is our last example for this section. We have this picture. We're told that the measure of angle D is twice the measure of angle E, and we're to find all the angle measures of the triangle. And I think I also need to tell you that this angle is 150 degrees. So if the measure of angle D is twice that of angle E, and we don't know the measure of angle E, let's call the measure of angle E X, and we'll call the measure of angle D 2X. We just learned about a relationship the 150 degrees is an exterior angle. It's going to be equal to the sum of the two remote interior angles. 
So all we're going to do is we're going to add the x and the 2x, and that's going to equal the 150. So if we simplify this, 150 equals 3x. Divide both sides by 3, and x has a value of 50. Now we are able to find all the measures in the triangle. Uh, okay, so we've got three angles in the triangle. We have angle E, we've got angle D, and we've got angle F. I'm referring to the F inside the triangle. Angle E equals x, x is 50, so the measure of angle E is 50 degrees. Angle D is twice that, so twice 50 is 100, which means that angle F has to equal 30 degrees so that the three add up to 180. You can also figure out the measure of angle F a different way. If you look at the 150, it is supplementary with the 150. So you could also figure out that that angle, uh, excuse me, figure out the measure of that angle by just subtracting 150 from 180. So these are your three measures. Seven point two is about two proof-oriented triangle theorems, and these two theorems you actually we've actually kind of talked about in class before last semester. So it's not going to seem too new for you. Your central question is how can I apply the no choice theorem and the AAS theorem to find missing measures? Here is the first theorem. If two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of a second triangle, let's pause there. So we'll say these two angles of this first triangle are congruent to these two angles of the second triangle. Then the third angles are congruent. So it's saying if you have a case like this, then that means these third angles have to also be congruent. Um, let's, let's try this with numbers. Let's say the angles with the one arc both equal 40 degrees. And the angles with the two arcs both equal 50 degrees. Well, if all three angles have to add up to 180, both of these angles would have to equal 90 degrees. And it just makes sense. So that is called the no choice theorem, because it just has to be so. And just as a reminder, if you look at these two triangles, if you think back to when we did congruent triangles, these two triangles have three pairs of congruent angles, which would be like an AAA, awesome authentic anchovy. But we know that that does not show us that we have congruent triangles. Rather, AAA shows us that we have similar triangles. Notice my two triangles are kind of the same shape. I know I didn't draw them to scale, but they can be different sizes. They have to be. They could be the same size, but they don't have to be exactly the same size. They can be, they can be a smaller one and a larger version. So just keep that in the back of your head. This second theorem says that if, and just to save words, I've illustrated it. If you have two triangles that are marked such as this, and if we remember this, this looks like AAS, which we remember is not one of our postulates that we can use to prove congruent triangles. But this theorem is saying if we have this, then the triangles are congruent. Let me explain why. It has to do with that no choice theorem. So we can't use AAS to say we have congruent triangles, but by the no choice theorem, because we have two pairs of congruent triangles, we know that these, this third pair of angles, excuse me, I meant angles, not triangles, this third pair of angles are also congruent. And if they're congruent, and I kind of ignore this other pair of angles down here, Right here, we can see that AAS becomes ASA. And ASA we can use to prove triangles congruent. So if you've got a picture and it looks like AAS, you know without having to go through the logic that those two triangles are congruent. You don't need to go through the no choice theorem to prove that you've got ASA. 
So let's try this with an example. In this example, we have two triangles that are marked. Their markings look like AAS. We're asked to find the length of BC and EF. We also know or have an expression for all three sides in each triangle. Because we see AAS marked, A, A, S, I know these two triangles are congruent. So we can set their corresponding parts equal to each other. In order to find BC and EF, we need to know the values of X and Y. Because we have two variables, we need to set up two equations. So we're just going to look at corresponding sides. One equation we might set up is that 3y equals 2y plus 6. That would be these two sides. Or we could look at the bottom two sides and make our equation look like this. 4x plus 10 equals 9x minus 5. Or we could look at the two sides that were originally marked and set those two equal to each other. That was 6x and 3y. We have three to choose from. If we look at the three equations, the first equation has only y, the second equation has only x, and the third equation has both x and y. I can solve the first equation for the value of y and the second equation for the value of x, and then we'll just plug them in. We don't have to use this last equation unless you just really, really want to practice substituting. So if we look at this first equation and we subtract 2y from both sides, y equals 6. If we look at the second equation and subtract 4x from both sides, 10 equals 5x minus 5, then we'll add 5 to both sides, 15 equals 5x, and then we'll divide both sides by 5, so x has a value of 3. Now that we know the two values, or the values of x and y, we can go ahead and plug them into bc and ef. bc equals 6x. If I replace x with 3, 6 times 3 gives us a value of 18. So bc equals 18. ef is equal to 3y, so if we replace y with 6, 3 times 6 also equals 18. And this makes sense because those two sides were congruent or corresponding in my congruent triangle, so they should have the same length. So that is everything. Here are the problems if you would like to attempt them or work ahead, and I'll see you in class.